Hi, and welcome to In The Metal. My name is Johnny McElhern. Uh, I'm based in Ireland and as editor of the Watch Press and also uh, intermediary for independent watch brands in Ireland since 2005. Uh, I specialise in the area of independent watchmaking. And each week, we are delighted to bring to you uh, a new guest who is uh, from inside the world of independent watchmaking, which is what In The Metal is dedicated to independent watchmaking and the people who make it happen. So each week, uh, myself and my partner in time, uh, the horological Hellraiser, ex-Anthrax uh, lead guitarist, uh, Dan Spitz, uh, we get the opportunity to talk to uh, one of the characters behind uh, watches and the watch brands that uh, that define independent watchmaking of our time. So we will go straight across to Texas and uh, welcome aboard Dan and say, how, how are you keeping, my man? What's going on, Johnny boy? All good? Everything good over there? Excellent. Excellent. Everything is wonderful here. Now it is, at least we... Uh, I have no audio, would you believe? Check uh, one, two. Check one, two. You got me? Give me one second, Dan. Give me one second. I'm not sure. Is your mic down? Check, check, check. One, two. No, my mic is good. Can't hear. Can't hear. So, um... Check one, two. Check one, two. I don't know. I, it, it's, it's possibly at this end. So, um... Uh-oh. Well, yeah. one thing's for sure. We will need to have her sound up. So, uh, g give me a moment. Um... Check yeah, one two. It Check looks one to be two. Working, but um, I don't know. We had audio there uh, before we started, so um, Dan, I'm sorry, man. I'm not sure what is going on here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, man. Never so had this problem before. The settings here. One second and uh, audio. Yeah, Check everything it. seems to be okay. Right, uh, we may need to uh, start this again. So. Um, if you could uh, hold on, folks, we will uh, be back in one moment. Thank you. Okay, Thomas has just commented there that uh, he can hear both of us. So uh, my problem is that I'm not hearing anything at this end, so I'm not sure why that is. When you get old, that's what happens. Dan, do you want to take this and I will figure out the problem at my <laughs> yeah. end? Uh, so, uh, listen, what we'll do then, yeah, if you can hear us, Let's go ahead then, and uh, we'll bring in uh, David. Does that sound okay to you? Check, check, one, two. David, That's welcome okay. aboard In The Metal. Thank you very, very much for uh, joining us, for doing the the great honour of uh, joining us for uh, for In The Metal. Um, it's uh, check, check. It long. And I'm, I'm apologizing here because my audio, I'm not hearing anything back at all. So I may have to uh, hook up a set of speakers and uh, we can go. But uh, Daniel, would you like to take the helm here and welcome aboard uh, David? Hey, David, nice to meet you. How you doing, bro? Nice to meet you too. Okay, and by so the way, I can hear you too very well. So, yeah, so it's all on Johnny's head. It's the first time we ever had audio problems. Sometimes we have video problems because people are... Uh, trying to get internet from inside their workshop down in the dungeons, seven layers deep in the earth or something. <laughs> well, I know we haven't met before. Uh, when I was saying before we started, I, I've been enamored by uh, the brand, what you do, what you guys represent um, for independent watchmaking and um, the push and the longevity you've had to push through. And we've all seen it, you know, all the other, my friends out there. Uh, it's incredible what you've done. We like to bring people on the show to show others the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes, the struggles of, you know, how real it is to, and how hard it is to push through and, and elevate where we are today. Cause it all, it all looks good to, to everybody now who starts tuning into independent watchmaking today and goes, Oh, look at all these incredible pieces, but they don't know what the struggle was for us to, to get represented. So we welcome you to the show, and uh, and we kind of, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. So get, 
give us a little uh, a background of the brand and, and how, you know, the inception of the brand and stuff. I guess we could just start from there. Okay. Well, as you know, um, Manufacture Royal was founded in the 18th century by the French philosopher Voltaire. And side joke, I have a good friend who's the CEO of another brand. And I will name it because he's a close friend. It's uh, Pierre Jacques from De Béthune. And yesterday he sent me a message saying that the Chevalier de Béthune actually helped Voltaire to create his workshop in Fernet Voltaire. And I thought that was a joke because that the first time he said that it was during a speech in uh, during the Singapore Watch Festival three years, four years ago. And I said, is he inventing the story? No, it was true. <laughs> it was actually true. Voltaire wow. stayed in the castle of Sully uh, that was owned by uh, De Béthune. And there was, there was something going on between those two guys. But uh, okay, so Voltaire created the, the founded the, the company in 1770. But uh, it was lost in the vicissitude of time. It didn't have any heirs behind. So the brand was relaunched in 2010. Mm -hmm. And we claim we are a young, reborn brand with a very creative uh, side, freedom of creativity, freedom of speech. Uh, and obviously, we don't have 250 years of history like many claims to have. We are right. proud of the heritage, but we play with it. Uh, with uh, a bit more uh, steampunk uh, and com complicated watches. Well, well, I guess you know they, they were. It sounds like they were playing in the castle way back then, partying, and doing whatever, whatever they were doing. So <laughs> it's good to play with it now. But you know what I was saying was, in 2010, it seems like uh, not many years ago, but in indie watchmaking, uh, that was just like on the cusp of us trying to, you know, us breaking through. You know, so it wasn't easy coming out with the designs that you guys were coming out with. But they're very at the onset, you came like a like a, like a fucking steamroller. You know, it was like boom, have this, and the designs were you know knocked everybody out. And uh, we congratulate you for, for taking that that step and not just following the norms of what has to be in traditional watchmaking because indie watchmaking, is, as we know, is it, it's our art. It really is. Uh, Whoever's controlling uh, the company, the bench, the watch, uh, it's our art, you know, and we can really break those boundaries now. In the but but design, is, design is really an issue because, you know, when we took over the brand, relaunched it, okay, I showed the androgyne to a few friends, colleagues from the industry, uh, well-known retailers. And when they saw the androgyne, they all went oh, like this. Mm -hmm. 10 years after, or well, 12 years after, this is the iconic piece of Manufacture Royale. It's our signature. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to people, you're right, that are used to classic things, they don't understand. And this is why also maybe it was our mistake in 2014 to launch something a bit more classical. Okay, we tried to, to get out of it and, and add some complication in it, but really having your own design, something, um, uh, something uh, strong and iconic is what brings value today to the brand. But it took 12 years, 12 years. Yeah, but you know what that means? That means just, just like in music, I don't know if you're familiar with my background and on the show, you know, it, it is, we get a lot of watchmakers and heads of watch companies. Um, who, uh, yeah, there's a lot of noise, Johnny going on yeah uh, background noise sounds like an echo is that yeah the mic the microphone is way too loud um forgive us for the technical difficulties people um what i was saying is that there's there's just a lot of people that uh that they don't want to step out of the boundaries and in music i, I kind of always make those correlations because the type of music i help to, to co-invent uh thrash metal uh, with my friends in Metallica and Slayer and Megadeth, we got that same thing you just said when we we tried to sell our music to the to the big record labels back then, which is how you had to get money to go into a big recording studio back then. We couldn't record in our laptops, and our music was so different. Basically, you were ahead of your time, as our music was ahead of our time. The underground nose catches on very quickly, right? The people who are hunting for something new to fit them 
and uh, fit them like a glove, fit their personality, fit the moment in time that they are in, in their life in that time. And then it takes a while for, for other people to grasp hold of someone who's really cutting edge and really ahead of the curve. So you were 10, 12 years ahead of the curve, like Paul Gerber with his triple rotor was ahead of the curve, 20 years, whatever it was. And those are the people that I think everyone will be uh, remembering later on. You know, they, you're, you're putting your stamp of history. And like you said, the first watch out of the gate is that it's like reverse 12 years late. Those are the ones that everyone wants. Man, you nailed it with that one because you weren't thinking about a watch. You were thinking about how, how can we just be who we are? But, you know, sometimes it's nice to hear it. Uh, self-confidence, uh, anyway, in any moment of life, you need self-confidence. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's true. I mean, um, before you join, uh, Johnny was mentioning the ADN spirit. When we gave the brief to, uh, to uh, a design company in Neuchâtel, they say, wow, you know, finally, we have somebody uh, coming and not asking us for a little bit of Patek, a little bit of Eau de Marpiguet and something else. They say you already have your design with the androgyne, so the ADN has to follow these codes. And we came out with this, which is so strong. Mm -hmm. And it was daring also. Everybody was saying, uh, do something small. We did something which has a 46 millimeter case. So it's very strong. Mm -hmm. But we had wow, to believe in our design, that the design was the right one. So it's a, always a bet, a gamble for the future. But it is. It was. It worked. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, Go ahead, John. Not like anything else. It's, uh, I, I love the, the avant-garde design, the brand cards that it's on. It's like a, a, a trapeze almost. It's like the watch suspended on a trapeze structure. And uh, it's, I, I love it. I use it in the promotional graphics for the, the episode tonight. And uh, it just really stands out. Nothing else like it. Yeah, it, it, it and, and and again, you know, it's the same same thing. You you you, you were mentioning design when um, when we drafted uh, the design. It was nice, of course. It was done in black. It was done in gray, and then I had a strap supplier that came came uh, with some colors samples, and there was that khaki color. So I said maybe we should do you know should do one, and actually it was the best seller for that for that uh, limited edition. It was the best seller with the khaki design. So we dared with the colors, with the design, and it's a, it was a cool match. Mm -hmm. No, you not not this one out of the park. Again, you know, breaking boundaries. Uh, you don't need to fit in. That's not what in, in, in the, indie watchmaking is anymore. You know, um, we don't really need to tell the time on our wrist that much. You know, I keep reiterating. We have time all around us, everywhere we go now. So now we can actually embrace that and release that and say okay well now we can make something that really fits someone's personality who w wants to wear something on their wrist that's is breaking the boundaries of micro mechanics not just necessarily having to oh I, I couldn't see the time in three seconds when i looked at my wrist it really isn't about that anymore uh, we're, we're past the brand names it's usually for a collector who's already climbed that ladder of all the brand names and is looking to to find what's beyond that. Who are the masters of the masters who are breaking their boundaries? And what's cool about that is the same as music now. That's what independent watchmaking is for me. It's the same as the music that I help create and all heavy metal and rock and roll. It's like you can go listen to this artist or that artist and everyone says, oh, I hate that guy. He sucks. Well, I love this guy. And the girlfriend says, I hate that guy and I love this guy. That's what indie watchmaking has finally become. Uh, it is art. Musical art is the same as, as uh, and that's what I'm tr trying to show the correlation because I think I'm pretty much the only guy who can. You know, I live both worlds uh, at, at their at their highest levels, and I and I hang out with the, the, those people who are the creators of both industries uh, my whole life, and it that's the correlation is finally here, and you're witnessing it. You're you're seeing it. You're you're creating your watch. And breaking those boundaries and going, I, I don't give a fuck. Just make it. it. It doesn't matter if it doesn't fit in. And in fact, this is what I like. And then it just so happens you realize, hey, wait a minute. There's other people that actually like what we're creating. You don't. It's not about finding the masses because we don't need to. We're, 
so many of us are backed up for how many years of, of orders already. So it means we're doing the right thing. We're being honest, right? Just like with us, with our music back then, we didn't dress up, put on makeup and use hairspray and become somebody else to go on stage. That's fake metal, right? That's fake. That's being, it's a show. It could be a Broadway show. That's a different thing, right? We're becoming someone else. But in our music, it was the same black, shitty, sweaty jeans I wear during the day and the same shitty t-shirt is what we hit the stage with. We just put on dry clothes. <laughs> That's all. It's the same <laughs> shit. We are who we are. And I feel that finally most of us in independent watchmaking have that same outlook now. We're free. We're free to be who we are. And you don't have to but please everybody. As, as, as I say, it takes time. Uh, it takes money because when you want to create something new, innovative, uh, you need to survive. And uh, it's a mix also between creativity, design, and how to make it work. So we're fortunate to have uh, to have uh, Jerome with us, who's the a watchmaker, and he used to work with me at Harry Winston, and he was part of the adventure of uh, MCT, also. So it's great because we can create, you know, anything in terms of design. But then you need the technicity behind and the capacity of producing it. So um, you need somebody like that. Yeah, let, let, so let's, precious. Let, let, yeah, exactly. Believe me, <laughs> I know the feeling. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you managed to, to, in the beginning, get this off the ground because we all know how hard it is to walk in somewhere and say, I want this many pieces. I'd like to have this manufactured, but you, you're not asking for a thousand. You know, that, that's always the independence problem. And that's what caused so many of us to go build our own workshops for small production and put up the millions of dollars to buy our own machines and, you know, and, and really because we can't get in that supply chain of, of the big guys. How did you manage to pull that off, bro? This is what people really want to know. Well, at the beginning, we were, we were kind of sourcing in-house because we had a partner company called Teke Bosch, and um, it was really helpful to develop uh, some, of the, some of the developments, and they were our own developments. So when I say we were doing in things in-house, we were doing things, the development, not the production. Obviously, and most companies, okay, except maybe Patek or whatever, don't produce in-house because you need those big machines. You cannot have 10 of them. It's half a million, you know, those five-axis machines. So you need to outsource. First, we were outsourcing, but it was assembled in-house. And the developments, the creativity was, was for us um, in an exclusive way. Now we have changed a little bit because our capacity is smaller. We do more unique pieces. And thanks to Jerome... We have access to different types of suppliers that can craft things for you. Um, in, after summer, we'll be launching a new variation, new movement. We will actually rebuild the bridges and stuff like that. And there's going to be only... So far, we've launched seven pieces, seven unique pieces. So it's not mass production. Well, it never been it never has been with manufacturial but there it's even less seven pieces seven unique pieces with bridges with with little things engine tune parts some of us, some of us will be just uh, sand uh, sand blasted we're not going to see big suppliers some guy with the machine with his things or the double tourbillon um, the blue dial uh, i sent johnny this was done uh, by hand the engraving was done by hand mm -hmm. Just and we've done we've done uh, wow. uh, three dials and three dials were different. That was done by Jerome. This is why this is why his name is on the dial. He's yeah. done it himself. So yes, with an old machine, but you can um, you can still find those people that are passionate that will spend hours in details to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. That's an absolutely spectacular piece. That's the uh, Michael Megas double flying tourbillon. Yeah, and the tourbillons revolve at different uh, frequencies, I think. Yeah, there's... yeah. One, one cage will turn in one minute and the other one will turn 10 times faster. Amazing, yeah. and they're coupled by a differential. Absolutely gorgeous. That, that, that's, but that's what you're explaining is true independent watchmaking. And that's, that's what we have to do. What I try to explain to people um, is... What, you, what you're explaining uh, is that we have workshops, but we don't call them workshops. They're prototype workshops. We're not meant to, to bang out uh, 100 or 200 watches. That's, that's not what 
we are. We, we can't do that. Like you said, each machine is a half a million to a million dollars, and one machine doesn't do what we what we need. You know, you need a you need a current milling machine. You need a screw making machine. You need a, a gear hobbing machine, uh, and it, and then you need the premises and the electricity and the money to pay for that electricity to keep those machines on twenty four hours a day is is crazy. So having smaller machines and people uh, like in my workshop here. We make prototypes, we can make a few pieces, and if we need more than that, we have friends who will help us make a few more, basically. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. you need to find, yeah, you just need to find the right sourcing to do this. And trust, because yes, timing, when you promise something to a client, you still need to respect time. Normally, we keep time with our watches, but we should not, we should not, we should not be putting pressure on the, on the production. I, I really think that the collectors now, they get us. They, they really, they, if it takes two years, if it takes three years, if it's a five year waiting list, they're pretty much all good at that, at that point now. And um, what you explain actually solidifies, you know, that not every piece is going to be the same. Pieces are going to have um, shit that's wrong with them. And that shit that's wrong with them is the shit that makes them right. It makes them human. Because you know what? None of us are perfect. As much as you, we want you to believe that, uh, you know, when I come out of school at Wall Step in Neuchatel and watch making, that was the beginning of that type of my career, that everything has to be every, so perfect and perfect. Yes, it does. But it also some of that takes away the humanness of who we are. I don't mind if I open up an old pocket watch and there's marks from the, 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 the person who made it because that's his marks. He's, he may be dead and gone 100 some odd years. And I look at that, and that's his scrape mark. That's his. This is that's his part of my life. That's his fuck up. But it it's, makes it real. It, it's human. It becomes a, 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 a there's a humanist to indie watchmaking. Uh, yeah, but that's there's fantastic. that's what's cool. There's not much room for imperfection when you come to something that is so precise as a double flying turby on and that. Like also, <laughs> it's a uh, to me, it's one of the things that makes. Manufacture Royale stand out because it is a very bold and very daring technical endeavor to do what you're doing. And also, as you said, David, that you have seven different uh, calibers, I think. Yeah. Is that oh, what 11, you mean when you say 11, seven different 11, pieces? 11, yeah, 11. We have 11 calibers. Wow. 11 calibers. Wow. Well, some, some are variation, and I admit one is coming from Concepto. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but you do work with some of the leading yeah. uh, suppliers and yes. innovators and uh, movement developers or designers and things. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, we work some. I mean, the, the the flying tourbillon on the micro mega case that was coming from the Cercle des Horlogers. It was modified by us, by Jérôme again, but it was coming from the Cercle des Horlogers. True. I yeah. think we have it. Yeah. yeah, this one exactly. No, the pr no, previous no. one. This one, yeah. Yeah, that's the micro mega micro tourbillon or micro rotor. It's a micro rotor, yes. Flying tourbillon, micro rotor. It was a unique piece in titanium. Yeah, I remember this one hmm. with the, uh, that had that cool, it was like a dial, but not a dial raised up above, exactly. It, yeah. Exactly, with engine tune like uh, like on a Bentley dashboard or something like that. Yep. With that with that grill and all this was polished by hand again by Jerome. So he had it produced and he, he polished him himself. So I really admire uh, you know the, the the skill of 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 a watchmaker that that is uh, that can do everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not only assembling; it's also creating, being part of the creative process. And on the other side, also, there's the, 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 the there's the biggest part, which is to repair, to find the solution, to make it make it work when there's a when there's an issue. Well, you got to find someone that also sees your vision, and he's the guy at the bench. You know, uh, I'm I'm going through that right now with, with the launch of my second company here. You all have to fit together. It's like a like the guys you got to find who are going to be in your band. You know, and you're trying out who's going to be the guitar player, who's going to be the singer. And some guys are really great guys or, or girls, and they play fucking amazing. They play a million times better than I could ever play, but they just don't fit. They're too fucking good, or they just don't fit. But when you find those people that fit, uh, you know, 
it just works yeah, but that's, clicks. Yeah, but that's that's not part of a of our small team or family team. We, we it's not a question of ego with Manufacture Royale. We don't care about this. So like a guy like Jerome, he will fit in. I need I need his, his technical expertise. I mean, I have my 10 years of experience with Opus at Harry Winston. So I know the suppliers, I know the, the crazy watchmakers, but we need it to make it work for Manufacture Royale. So I need him. I need this technical input. I need this technical limit to say, no, this cannot be produced. I have my own limits too. Uh, I know some colors cannot be done. I know some, some suppliers cannot do this, but we need we need uh, we need to have somebody like that. And on the other side, we need his creativity too, because he can tell us, you know, you've, the designer has done this, but I could do this more. You mentioned a brand a few minutes ago with MCT that yes. Jerome was in, involved with. And to me, I think that they were possibly just ahead of their time by a year, maybe. I think they would be flying now if the the world wasn't just ready for them but uh, so for you to have come through the path that you've come through with uh, uh, Harry Winston and uh, on to uh, establishing your own uh, did I know you obviously work with them as well yeah. and um, also recognizing that having someone like uh, Jerome on board is essential to making the whole thing work uh, well, it's a it's a it's sharing experience i mean jerome was at the beginning of mct and mct suffered also you know technical issues many things so um it, it was it was a friendly encounter we had lost each other you know lost sight and i bumped into him at the PSG, you know the, um, the the suppliers fair in june and that was, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago. And okay, it was like it was meant to be. We are back together and he's helping us working um, and accompanying everything, everything uh, for us. Brilliant. So uh, to, to look at uh, some, of, some of his work, there was a few things that I had seen in the images that you very kindly sent to me today, uh, David. And uh, this, I, I haven't seen this before this yeah the, the, this i sent you because the, because there was a very nice picture of jerome um um Working and he's it. done everything but maybe it's not the the right moment to talk about this how about that no i will <laughs> tell you why this this was double tourbillon revolution we've done five pieces to celebrate the crimea bridge oh. And I think these watches were probably a gift for Putin. So this is why, forget about this. Okay. It's really not the right timing. But this, it was uh, when I sent it to you, I didn't think about it. But it's it was to see the creativity, the design, the hand. Yeah. This, this bridge was done as a as a decorative side and also a kind of a bridge. But come on, with what we know today and the situation we are in, sure. <laughs> forget about this story. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. we yeah. will move briskly along from that, dude. Yeah. <laughs> We, we are getting it from all sides tonight, aren't we, with the uh, technical uh, as well as... The, I'm under uh, the storm, but I'm still surviving until I can yeah. still see you and hear you. I think Dan has a, there's a, a storm at his end as well, so uh, the lights have gone out there. But um, So take us through, where, where would we uh, go, go next? So for, you started with the 1770 was the debut piece if i'm not wrong yeah for, for when we took over the brand yes because they had already uh two, two watches the incredible uh and i didn't send this one the the, the, the incredible opera you know which was the minute repeater yes tourbillon with the echo chamber then of course there was the baby opera what we call now the androgyne and we came out with this but that was 2014 so a very nice tourbillon position at seven o'clock flying tourbillon uh, so a different caliber with a power reserve um, it was mostly it's true it was dedicated for for asia the asian client wanted something more classical we did do well with it uh, the case was inspired even though you cannot really uh, notice it now but it was inspired by the androgyne you have those two large lugs 
with the two screws we do there. So it was yes. still around within two arches, like the androgyne construction, but sure. in a much more classical way. An absolutely beautiful piece. And um, so that, but that was in 2014. You also had that entered into GPHG. Yes. And uh, hopefully we have Dan back. Yes, he's back. All good. Uh, With no see, sound. Yeah. Check, check. Yeah, sound yes, yes good. Too. all good. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those days. It's nothing. Really it's one of those days. <laughs> But uh, anyway, good to see yeah. you back again. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm used to that. You know, you go on stage and then these things don't work. <laughs> you still gotta play. <laughs> <laughs> you get used to it. You throw shit at your roadie, but that's you know after that, there's nothing you can do. So uh, anyway, we're we're just looking at the 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 beginnings of uh, manufacturing oil uh, in the new uh, era. Because one of the questions, and thank you, Thomas, because Thomas has asked a fantastic question, David. Uh, may I ask, is it easy to deal with such a great history and a tradition as manufacturer oil? Is it a burden? Or if I could add something that doesn't give you freedom? Um, the answer is that we, we, we came out of it with a twist. Because, um, as Thomas is saying, yes, we have an heritage, we have something strong, but it could have been, you know, old and dusty. Okay, let's do a brand with very classical piece because it's coming from the 18th century and Voltaire was selling to the kings and queens and the Tsar. We took it out. We took some quotes out of him. We took, um, I mean, Voltaire was a troublemaker. You know, I mean, he was, he was established in Geneva and he was kicked out of Geneva. So he created his own workshop just across the border, Fernet Voltaire today is like one kilometer from the, from the Swiss uh, border. And he had up to um, um, 400 craftsmanship, craftsmen, employees. Wow. And, uh, and when you look in the books of, of uh, Fernet, you see that uh, he even sold or produced 4,000 watches one year. So wow. it was something strong. He wanted to, to trouble, you know, to create trouble with the, the, the Swiss... Uh, uh, in watch industry, but yeah, we pulled out of this using some some quotes, some famous quotes. Like, I mean, even in our speech, in our advertising, Voltaire used to say, "Dare to think for yourself." I think it matches perfectly what we just said before, what Dan said about the creativity of all the independent brands. Who cares what you have on your wrist? Mm -hmm. The rest, your a watch should not be a social status. Yes. Rolex is. Yes, Richard Mille is probably. But for us independent, no. The, I think, I believe the clients, the collectors buy it to please themselves. They have something unique on the wrist. Um, and that's it. But that speech doesn't work for or doesn't get to everyone. Well, because I, uh, there wasn't this awareness even seven, eight years ago of who we were. You know, we, people like me, we, we were signing NDA agreements and creating gears and parts and designs for the larger companies not allowed to say anything or testing their timepieces for longevity and doing all that stuff. But now we're at the forefront. I remember, you know, in my service centers, after sales service centers, people would come in and like you said, they, they were climbing the social ladder. They just came out of law school or they become a doctor. And the first thing they want to do is buy something nice for themselves. So they buy a Rolex or whatever. And then they meet another one of their colleagues and he's got a Patek and the other guy's got a Odomaz and the other guy's got a Vacheron. And they're learning about what it is, and they really are out to impress others at that point. But I think uh, it's grown way past that now because they want to know what is past that. And now because of Instagram, uh, which is basically our own magazine direct to the, to the people without having to pay for the advertising at, at all, we can show the behind the scenes of what it really takes, what it really takes to manufacture something uh, in, in micro-mechanics. And, man, it's mind-blowing to them. It's not just... Oh, look at the hands and the dial is pretty. It gleams when I move it in the light. It's really not that anymore. It's our story. It's the humanness of who the fuck we are. And like I, I, I we started before we came on, I said to you, the struggles. Because what we do in business and in life, all of us, it's never easy. Nothing's easy. We all have our struggles. Every one of us. I don't care who's smiling in front of you. 
We all have our struggles. And it's wonderful to see other people have those struggles and then make something beautiful from that struggle. And then give that love to someone, to a collector. He gets to put that piece of that watchmaker's time with his life on his wrist. It's not just a commodity anymore. That's yeah. a different watch. True. I, I have something to chip in there as well, because as I have said before, that I believe that independent watchmaking gives the collector that uh, ability to wear something that is exclusive, that is very individual, which because people are always looking for something where that is makes them feel that they're exp able to express their personality, and that is through the medium of independent watchmaking. Well, think about this. Think about music back in the 80s, in heavy metal music, right? You had what the record companies were buying to feed the ants, right? Uh, whatever was on the radio, that's what a, a normal average person would they, would, they would never dive deeper than what they were fed. So they would think, okay, so that's, I guess, what I listen to. But then there was punk rock, you know, the underground, the real, oh, the darkness, don't go to that club. Your mom will tell you you might get injured. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, that's independent watching. That's, that's, that's what we can give to somebody, uh, that love that comes straight from us. That's why people in the beginning wanted to jump on stage with our kind of music. And, and they didn't just want to jump up there like a pop band and dance around. Look, look I made it to the stage, little Linda Lou. Look at me up here. I can get a picture. It was <laughs> nothing to do with that. It was, it was like Grateful Dead syndrome because they want to be, they feel they are in your family. They feel like they are in your band. They are part of the band. I was just listening to that music. And I feel that is exactly what we all have finally in independent watchmaking. At, at, at a certain top level of what we do, like what you do, David. It's when we meet those collectors, they, they, they don't want to just buy the watch and go, thank you, man, this is amazing. I can't believe the work you put into it. They, they want to go, can, can I come to the workshop? Can I, can, I, can I see how he makes this one part? It's been bothering me forever. I really want to know. I don't care how much it costs. I'll pay for everything. Can I come hang? Can, can I take you out to dinner? It's a personal thing. And they feel like they're, they, they want to, if they could, just hang out in your workshop. And I, I think that's really, we've arrived. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, but that's, uh, the, as I said, it takes time, patience. Um, so it's, it's the balance between building a brand, even independent, small, and, and be, being patient, patient. When look, uh, look at Acrivia, it's the same story. I remember the, the poor except uh, in some shows, uh, he was alone, nobody was interested. That was like five, six years ago. And now he has a waiting list for what, two years? But what we yeah. should all, what everyone should learn from, from Acrivia, which a magnificent people, mm -hmm. magnificent brand, magnificent timepieces, is he was one of the first to utilize social media the right way, letting everyone in right to his tweezers, to the tip of his fucking tweezers, we watched. And everyone was like, holy wow. shit. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And everyone yeah. Again, I've often said that I believe that social media has been a great leveler that has allowed mm -hmm. independent watchmaking to penetrate into the mainstream. Maybe not into the mainstream, but definitely away from the dark, faded edges of the periphery of the, of the watch industry. Me and Johnny, oh, we, we always goof because, if, and you probably remember this, Dave, you look back like 10 years or so when you started, and like, if you went to like a, a, a watchmaker's website, it looked like it was like from 1978, right? Even today, it's still look, it's like the skinny little page, you know? It looked like they, they made it like an HTML, they wrote the code themselves. They just, they, they didn't, they don't want to embrace it. They're busy at the bench. So how do you, how do you find time? How do you do both, right? How, how can you do both? The problem is they didn't realize, uh, you know, it, it costs a lot of money back in the 80s or the 70s and 80s to actually, if you wanted to do this, if you wanted to make your own timepieces like you or I, then, then okay, we make the timepiece, now how do we reach the public? Uh, so you have to take an ad out in this magazine, that's five grand, that's 10 grand for a bigger one, 15 grand for this one. It all starts to add up, so now you, now you need a bank, you need backers. But if they would embrace what you have, Instagram, which is a magazine, your own magazine for free, and you got YouTube, which is your own television channel for free, then you can be direct to the public 
and do that. But how do you balance those two? Uh, how do you produce as as well as uh, as do that as a one man show? You know, it's very it's really hard. But you have those opportunities now, and uh, that's that's why we're, we're we're able to reach the the, the consumers the right way and represent ourselves. If you go on everyone's uh, independent uh, watchmaking Instagram, you'll see how we all differ. Yeah, some of them are. We're all polishing screws and showing you how you blew a screw and how you make a Geneva stripe and all that. But beyond that, it really is telling their life story. And, and that, that's the human sense. That's, it's real. There's no, no fake metal it's, there. It's always been a, a passion and a human story. That's for sure. But then again, mm -hmm. again I'm saying, um, you know, I'm an humble person. So ego doesn't work. I was told mm -hmm. I was not a watchmaker. This is why some retailers didn't want to take Manufacturial. Yes, I'm proud. I'm not a watchmaker. But I have Jérôme or I have other people that are very talented. An independent brand is not about one-man show. It can be in some cases. Um, you have fantastic people, but it can be also something different. It can be a team of different things. And we like to create our own pieces. And even though I cannot assemble anything, I can imagine things. Yeah. But I'm not daring to say I'm a creative director. I just love the combination here, for, for example... Uh, it's just good. That was sold last week. So, you know, you, you say, okay, I have it for a few months. Is it will, will it, will it be sold? And then somebody likes it and somebody will take it. Mm -hmm. And you're proud of your achievement and proud of daring the, some colors. And there again, uh, independence, I've always opened the door to many things. Um, who dared to put a movement in blue a few, I'm going to say, yeah, a few years back? Mm -hmm. There was Manufacture Royale, there was MBNF. Uh, and that's it, maybe Louis Moinet. Now you even see Bulgari, you see Cartier doing new, new, new movement in colors, but they're just following a trend that the independence created to dare to create Very something much. out of the out yeah. of the box. Exactly, you just said it. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, they they they'll jump on the the artistic creators uh, who have really are the the creators. But, but people know who the real creators are. They remember that. And uh, don't, you know, if they can get a hold of those few pieces like yours that come directly from you and Jerome, then they're getting it from the creator. Hmm. And it's, it's wonderful to break boundaries and, and feel uh, you know, that you've done that. You stepped outside the box. That's yeah. gorgeous. Gorgeous watch, man. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. You. Gorgeous. Just uh, on, on the regime, Turbion. And... Uh, Again, this is a piece that is key to the manufacturing Royale portfolio. And, yep. uh, but it just I think it defines what manufacturing Royale are so about. about. It, it's unconventional. It doesn't conform with the norms of watchmaking design. It's beautifully finished. Having handled these watches myself, David, in your company, uh, they're absolutely amazing pieces. And uh, so it's great. And this part, piece was so last week. Yeah, it was so last week. And when, when I see a big close-up like this on my screen, I, I, I find it really amazing. It's, it's a mix between something daring and something super classical. I just, I just like it. Mm -hmm. And like this, the, this combo of, uh, of blue and rose gold, just, I mean, okay. I like it. I'm in love with my products. Sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> believe it. It's killer, man. It's, it's beautiful. I also mm -hmm. see, uh, that, like, on your Instagram, that you are, you have, uh, you are showing Jerome at the bench with your bespoke, yeah, bespoke pose and, and that kind of stuff, yeah. which is great. We'd love to get always, him on here too. Always, always. I mean, Jerome always has his. I mean, you see, you saw on the double tourbillon, his name is on it. On the mm -hmm. on the micro uh, the micro rotor, the na his name was on the back on, on the movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's his. That's his work. Also, that was my imagination. But the shiny center sunrise like this. That's his work. The engraving, Beautiful. and of course the assembling. But but the engraving of the dial. It's very unique engraving too, isn't it? I wonder will this work. Just give me a second. See if this uh, we have. craftsmanship you cannot you cannot do that uh, in an industrial way and i don't want it in an industrial way i want each piece to be to be different and unique mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a very distinctive uh, p- pattern. It's a hmm. awesome. That's what it's all about, right there. You know, that look. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm going to relate. It's what I do, right? I'm all about handcraftsmanship and being unique. And I'm a, you know, my workshop here has taken years and years and years just to find, you know, that one machine that will do that one certain look or certain finish or certain whatever it is. That's what it's all about, you know. It's, it's creating creating arts, micro mechanical art, and finding the people that can help you do it. For me, it's the same as the situation that you're that you're explaining, uh, and it's it's the same in music where. You notice that a lot of bands, they can make wonderful music and write great songs and do what they got to do, but they need a manager. They need someone so that they can do what they do and the manager can take them where they need to go to get those people to come to the show, to buy the product and to, to make it bigger and bigger and bigger for a little bit more of a mass appeal. And it's, I think it's the same thing in independent watchmaking. It's really hard as one person. We need that that manager, that that, that partner like, like you are to your watchmaker, uh, you got to be a team, uh, so each person can concentrate on their expertise, uh, and, and then you really can get something done, and you can really move and uh, really give something back to the world. Because you got to remember, this is just like music. You're giving back something as a timepiece, and you love it, and it looks great, and this is me. But you, you are someday going to be gone from here. That piece will, it will fucking live on a long time if it's built right, a very long time. So. When you're, someone's in, in their service center opening up the back of the watch someday, 150 years from now, you know, you want him to say, like, just put his tools down, like like when I opened my first Patek Philippe, and just go, like, oh, holy shit, like old Patek, like when it was made by, mainly by hand. Like, I, like holy shit, like how, how, how do they do that? Then you would take the bridge off as a watchmaker, and it would be decorated underneath the bridges where only a watchmaker would ever see that part. They didn't need to do any of that. So decorate, and you put your tools down again, and you go, holy shit. Yeah, that's, that's, what, you, that's what you got to well, leave behind. Uh, like, I, I didn't know. I mean, okay, today we are producing movements. Um, uh, it's hand-finished. But in the old days, I didn't know that the movements were paired, the components. They were not mass product, produced. They were okay. paired. So um, with Jerome, we had uh, an idea of using very old movements. And we f- we thought it was too complex because if you wanted to replace parts, you could not. They were actually paired. You cannot take a part from another movement. It would not be exactly how it should fit. So it was more complex in the, in the old days, I guess. Interesting that, because I'm... Do you mean that... Uh, you could take a movement from one piece and, t- and try to take a component out of it and put it into another that are supposed to be identical, but they wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's that's what we we found out. I mean, it could work, but it needed you know m- more adjustment, and it was not that easy. More work than it was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, we are back to the independent world again uh, today. This is what you have to do. I mean, Dan was mentioning before. You uh, with the with the the level of quantities we are doing, it's like most pieces are prototypes. They're not. They are. They are. They are. They are. They are, they are full. But the the, the, the way the, some components are designed, I mean, what what is a prototype? Is something that will be done, you know, one by one, a unique piece is a prototype. But you, yeah. you specialize in bespoke pieces, so yes. like a big part of Manufacture Royale's business model is the bespoke catering to your customers' individual requirements, their needs. How, how much is a, a, a part of the Manufacture Royale operation is the bespoke sector? I would say uh, a lot more than half but it's true that with respect what i'm going to say is with respect clients do not often know what they want so sometimes we have to create in advance we have to show them the colors if somebody says you know you pr- present some a case like an androgen case still and you say you know imagine the movement not rhodium plated but imagine the movement in purple in green whatever they don't like th- like this one the orange with the the the, co- the balance um, uh, um, the barrel cover in orange it's difficult for clients to imagine 
something, the combination. So we have to create, let's say in advance, and we say it's our bespoke collection or bespoke offer. And then sometimes from this, client will say, yes, but can you modify this? Okay, yes. Why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Try that. Try that in a big brand. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But this is this is why we are we are you know we do true bespoke. Yeah, uh, I remember a big article I think three or four years ago for for a huge brand, Cartier, and they were mentioning bespoke. But bespoke is simply because you could adjust, you, you can switch your, your metal bracelet to the leather brace, bracelet. That's not bespoke to me. That was not bespoke. I was very frustrated. That should not be used. And then the word bespoke should not be used. A bespoke is when you have a watchmaker or talented craftsman doing something special for you behind the scene. Yes. That's a bespoke piece. Yes, yeah. Exactly. And I think I get what you mean. Like if you create something, that sparks the imagination to allow the customer to say, ah, you could do that in orange, or you could do that in blue or purple. Can you do it in green? But, that, but that's bespoke. That's a, a husband and, or a future husband and wife getting married, and her favorite color is this, or his favorite color is that, and she sees one of David's pieces, like he said, and, oh, I don't want to tell him, but I want to present this to him at our wedding. But his favorite color is is, is blue, and uh, David made a, a prototype, and, it, and the dial was a different color. You can do that just for just for them. That's bespoke. Okay, yeah. it can go way crazy as well. You know, can you do this? Can you do that? Uh, that that that's bespoke. Not changing a strap or a buckle. You know, and that's corporate. <laughs> no, true. Exactly. Totally true. But, but that you can get whatever you want in indie watchmaking. You can get uh, a, what I just described, or it, the world's your oyster. You could find someone in, in indie that'll make you a complete timepiece, even even changing mechanics just for you that no one else would have. That you can find that gentleman. You can find. Yeah, you you, uh, you can, but but it's also a question of being reasonable. I mean, often, uh, often no. But I had a couple of times clients say, "Yeah, I love your watch, but can you make an androgyne in sapphire or in ceramic?" There, there's no economy, uh, you know, economy of scale. Doing one case in ceramic or in, mm. or in, in sapphire, mm. the, the, the price will be astronomical. So there's no point going forward unless the guy is a billionaire and he wants to do it. But I, I think we have to reason the clients to mm. advise them in a proper way. Because at least for manufacturing, it's part of our DNA. The price needs to be uh, uh, correct. Yeah, it has to make sense. I agree. I agree totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, approach to, and, and that's what, one thing about manufacturing oil that has spoken to me because I've written a lot of articles about the different watch that you create, and there's always something different about them. It's there's very little, if you like, cookie cutting. It's there's there's always something that's the, maybe it's the technique that's applied to the the finish of the dial or whether it's the uh, the Adonai's movement bridges or the, the the different colors that are applied. It's they're always something different. Every one of them are interesting in their own right. How are you, how are you guys coming about the, the design and and those uh, the beginning. Uh, can you explain to people how you come up with the design? How how who who's working together to execute the actual designs? Say you, you decide, okay, we're going to make a whole new uh, a whole new movement, not just a design of a dial or something like that. Um, it's again, it's a it's a joint effort between a watchmaker, or Jerome in in our case, um, because we need the technical input and a designer uh, and myself because I have some images in my head. It's exactly like, like we mentioned before. The, the, um, you need to sparkle the idea of, uh, to the client. Same for me. I like if the designer will... Okay, there is things I can tell you right away. I will not go this way. It's not Manufacture Royale. It's not the way. But sometimes designer, different ones, bring you uh, new ideas that will sparkle into something else. And then, of course, on the other mm -hmm. side, you have 
the watchmaker that will tell you, yes, this I can produce, or this I cannot produce, it will be too technical. Joining the three forces creates something, um, uh, a daring project. So yes, sometimes I agree that one of the three pillars will become more important. Sometimes, you know, you, you want this, uh, and it's based out of technique, and design comes it's secondary. You already have your case, you're, it's secondary. And sometimes the, the designer is completely off. And I'm just asking a graphist to do it. I said, look, I, I don't need a designer. I know I want this like that. Like the voltage you show with the Sunray. I said, I want the dial here. No, um, the, the other one. The, um, okay. But th th this is the same, actually. This is the same. When I, when I, I wanted a GMT out of the voltage. And I said, I, I want the, the GMT, but I want the volume on the other side. Because th this, this model, which is called Haute Voltage, was coming out of the voltage. We had only the, the, the escapement and the balance wheel flying like this, hour and minute. And I wanted the GMT to add something more. But I said, I need like the counterpart volume. You have the, the balance wheel floating above. Well, the second... Uh, GMT dial, the small one with the 12 in red, is also higher on the dial. And you have the, the both bridges like slides on both sides. That was not the designer's idea. That was directly my idea put into place by the, the, the guy manufacturing the movement. The designer came after mm -hmm. just to put the colors and put the small design of, on the numbers. That's it. I love the old voltage. It's, so it's not, it's not always, the, I would say it's not always the same recipe. Mm -hmm. We are not, I mean, again, we are not a big company where you have a board that will decide uh, and you have the creative director. No, it doesn't work like that. It's a mix. It's a melting pot. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. best idea will come out. Without uh, being sure, without being sure, it's the best idea. <laughs> that's the crazy, <laughs> that's the crazy yeah. part. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's exactly it. What you described. That's that's why I, I just kind of shut up over here. And that is um, what what we all strive for to when we create our art, right? To be uh, not in a box and not in a boardroom to bounce the ideas off. Because sometimes one year somebody has some really good ideas, and sometimes the next year somebody else has even better ideas. And then sometimes the third year together you have wonderful ideas, and that's yeah. that, that's that's what's great about what we do as independent watchmakers. You can bounce off each other, bounce off the time in everybody's life, and keep creating wonderful art, unhinged, and and, and with nobody to, to tell you no, you know. And you just got to be daring and put it out there. Maybe you know how scared musicians are when they put out a new song. Does anyone even realize that? We know what we got. <laughs> We're in a room with, with, with yes people going, fuck, man, that's amazing. That's so killer. It's great. This is, oh, man, people are going to freak out, you know? And then you can put that song out and everyone was like, man, eh, it wasn't as good as their last album. And then you can be in the studio and the song that you didn't even think was the song is the song that everyone somehow latches on to. So everyone is going to have different tastes. Some people like vanilla ice cream. Some people like chocolate. Some people like swirl. <laughs> you know, you don't got to, you're never going to please everyone. If you could please less than 1% of the people uh, with your art and uh, not have to sit in a boardroom and people tell you, no, you can't have your art out there, then then it's a wonderful thing. You find those less than 1% people because uh, they're the believers. That's all you have to know. I did, I did sit in boardrooms. Party. in my past life and I didn't fit I told my CEO I did not agree with him yeah, good. He, he was not happy <laughs> but, yeah. but that was, that was the, the, the bad the bad uh, era of Harry Winston that was at the end I mean at the end yeah. not you, finished. Before, that was at the end Max was gone and the others were gone so okay yeah yeah, uh, I a funny thing. I, I was reading a it's not funny, but I was reading a, an interview with you earlier on today with the, the wonderful Angus Davies, and he was one of the questions he had asked and put to you was about the effect of outsourcing design to different designers and how each brings their own interpretation to the the codes that define. Manufacturer Royale. 
and that has, by association has uh, resulted in some of these most incredible pieces. No, it's true, but always there's always a backbone, and the backbone is us, the family. We 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 want to keep you know the design. So yes, it's refreshing to have different designers. I mean, some of our brands will only use uh, uh, only use the same, but we like to create something different because mm. it's a it's a new input. Um, some of the designers are uh, people I know for a very long time, like Stéphane Avranche. He was already working for us uh, at Harry Winston. And some of us are new because you need new, fresher ideas. And why not? As long as the DNA, as the codes are respected. That's just as simple as this. And we are, um, we are the ones keeping those values. That's it. And that was my nickname. That was my nickname uh, when I was younger. Max, Max well, Busser called me the, the the guardians of the value. <laughs> it's true, but I'm like this. I I, I think I have. A, okay, I'm not a watchmaker, but I have a sense of uh, common now sense. You're the I, I, I like, now, I like... now you're the guardian of the empire. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, I, would, I would prefer the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> yeah. And Jerome is he's your Jedi, Jedi Knight. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> I will tell him. I will yeah. tell him. That's how this works, man. You got to find your Jedi. Otherwise, none, well, everyone's napkin drawings do not become reality <laughs> unless you find a Jedi like me. <laughs> oh, man. So away from the world of making watches and presenting these incredible concepts to masterpieces to the your customers how do you unwind oh, sorry i didn't how do you this unwind do you, do, you, do, you, do you drink do you go to heavy metal concerts do you listen to jazz you know what you... johnny what i do to uh, to <laughs> to free my spirit I you know that. and you know where i'm coming from nature now. <laughs> i'm on the lake paddling racing oh. You know that. I love that because on your website it says uh, on the contact section yes. it says uh, contact we may not be here we may be out on the lake you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I told you. <laughs> I, yes. I, I can connect with those values uh, <laughs> having done a little bit of windsurfing in my time I uh, do love getting out on the water myself. No, but it's true. Yeah. I mean, when you're on the water, when you're in the, the Geneva Lake, you see the you leave your problems on shore and you see the world in a different way, whether you're alone or with friends paddling, competing, yeah. not competing, doesn't matter. Just, you know, it's kind of a different freedom yeah. and you have to respect nature because uh, like like now, I mean, I was I was coming out of the lake and then uh, a friend just called me and said, can you come and pick me up? Because uh, there was a big storm that was not forecasted and the guy was stuck somewhere. So, you know, you, you have to be humble there? there again. I'm also a lake guy. I grew up in the Catskill Mountains of New York, a little less than a mile from the real Woodstock site. Like where the, my, my, dad, my, my dad owned a lot of the land going up to the site, and I'm on a lake, big, massive lake here as, as well. I can't, I can't get away from water. It's just it's in me. Same thing. Totally, totally with you on that, bro. Yeah, I, I cool. go with myself. No, I should go like this. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus, I spent much time staring at Lake Neuchatel as well, as you can well imagine, going to school at Wostep, man. I'm just in my benches right there as well, just looking looking at the lake. So, so what about music? What do you listen to there, David? To a mix of everything. everything. When I was a young kid, I was listening to ACDC and Status Quo. Status Quo? Yeah. yeah. That was <laughs> but uh, no, now it's just more. It goes from, from, you know, world music, jazz, anything. It's okay. I don't have something very specific. I, I like to enjoy good music. No. Getting into a bit of techno or whatever they got. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Let's no, no, no. <laughs> not no. go that far. <laughs> no. no, I don't like the boom, boom, boom. No, it's not my stuff. See you here. See you here. Four on the floor. Mm. Well, listen, we have just gone over the hour. And we have had one or two 
little technical glitches this evening. And I'm not convinced we're out of the woods yet either. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I think it would be just great just to say, to, to thank you, David, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. And also for all of the collaboration you did with me with the images, feedback, the content that you provided to me about the different images that we were able to put up for tonight. And uh, I can only apologize for things that I have no understanding of that have failed <laughs> us tonight. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, but, uh, I, I, I think of it the other way. We're, we're all blessed to be in a time where we can do this. You know, uh, just a few years ago, we, we couldn't, totally. we couldn't, couldn't just hang out, you know, like this. So this, it's really cool. If you had a few glitches, I hope everyone that's watching understands and everyone that's watching in the future understands that at this time in, in independent watch history, it's a momentous time. We've, we've finally broken through to the other side where we can all create our own art. And Johnny, I like to bring on movers and shakers uh, uh, and people behind the scenes to so you can see behind the scenes, the behind the scenes to see how it was done, how it is done uh, for future generations to really tune back in here and know uh, what the struggle was back here to, to give our love and our art uh, back to the world. And, and David has, has, has proven uh, himself time and time again to think outside the box, to do outside the box, to put out things that would have never passed in a boardroom. And somehow, some way, there's so many people that fall in love with his timepieces uh, and, and, and the, the creation team that's, that's along the ride with him, that he somehow convinced these crazy people to come along with him on that ride. That's what we're all about. We're a bunch of crazy people creating intense, crazy micro mechanics, and we're giving it back to you. So we hope you appreciate that, and we hope you appreciate David's valuable time because he could be drawing on napkins his next timepiece, and he wasn't doing that this afternoon. He was he was with us, and giving back to you. So make sure you take a look at his timepieces because uh, they are seriously badass, um, totally badass. Thank you, David. We appreciate it, man. Well, thank you very much. That was cool. Without a doubt, everyone. Sure. Thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight for this episode of In the Metal. And we look forward to welcoming you all back in our next episode, hopefully next week. But uh, for now, I want to thank you again and, uh, and to David. Uh, we wish you the very best of success and hope that Manufacture Royale continues to develop and create and breaking the rules, creating these extraordinary watches and uh, keep going. Thank you. Good job, brother. Okay.